Um, we're from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm a Spelman graduate, class of 84. I have a brother that's a Morehouse grad, class of 96. Um, you know, I always have looked at programs, you know, for our son to attend some type of academic or leadership program in the summertime. David is also an Eagle Scout. So, you know, just um, with other programs and looking at leadership, he's also been the freshman class and the sophomore class president at his high school. So when we looked at the um, leadership, the Coca-Cola leadership program, we thought that it was, you know, a good match for David. Scary. Scary. So y'all please take care of my baby. <laughs> yeah. It's scary. But it's exciting because this is part of his future. It's the beginning. So I think he's going to have a good experience. I'm truly blessed to be chosen today to come and spend the whole week at this campus. And I feel like I'm going to hopefully make a difference and learn new things, so I'm really excited. I just want him to be able to do whatever he want, be whatever he want, have a say-so in what he do, because he has two strikes against him already. He's a black male, and I want him to be in charge of his life, not other people. Yeah. And it seems to me he's taking charge right now because this was his idea. So I think he's on his way. I think it's very important. Um, for young people today to be able to experience different cultures and diverse groups of people to make them more well-rounded themselves as a young person. You know, when I was growing up, you always went back home, but I feel now that it's going to be very important for kids to be able to be more diverse in the society in order to be, you know, successful in things that they do. I've been at Morehouse College since 1998, and uh, I first came on board after developing a strategic plan for uh, uh, Dr. Walter Massey, who was then president of Morehouse College. He just received a very generous gift from the Coca-Cola Company uh, to develop a world-class leadership center. Uh, I was presently serving as the Dean of Black Church Studies at the uh, Colgate Rochester Divinity School. And before then, I had uh, taught at Harvard University in the college, uh, Vanderbilt uh, University in Nashville, Tennessee, and at Dillard University. And I was trained primarily as a social ethicist, though um, I also was a pastor in New England for several years and uh, had always had keen interest in developing uh, youthful leaders. Uh, one of the reasons I was in the pastorate, I was trying to answer some fundamental questions. Uh, what is the relationship of spirituality, ethics, and leadership? The pre-college program uh, at the Leadership Center here at Morehouse College, it's really our premier program. Uh, we take 30 young men from around the country and we put them through an intensive uh, ethical leadership training program. The purpose for doing this has to do with, we're looking for emerging leaders. So what we do is we talk to them from the standpoint of uh, creating a beloved community. And by creating a beloved community, we use components such as love and courage and wisdom and integrity, uh, honesty, uh, basic components and easy language that they can understand. Uh, please give me your name and uh, where you're from and what your expectations are. Hello everyone, my name is Joshua Mann. I am in Northern Virginia, that's where I reside and live, and a little bit south from Maryland, but I go to Robinson High School, and the reason that I'm here is to further develop my leadership skills as many others share that same goal, and at the same time, I just want to um, 
develop those leadership skills in an, in an environment that is surrounded by other leaders. And I believe that part of honing a skill is being around people that are profound or, and are very skilled at that skill. So I'm happy to be here and I hope that I'm able just to um, further my abilities as a leader. My name is Justin Jones. I go to St. Sebastian School in Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Joey Dillon. I'm from Silver Spring, Maryland, and I attend Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. Um, I found out about the program through my mom. She told me about it, and I thought it'd be a phenomenal experience to come here to Morehouse and see what Morehouse is all about and what the program has to offer, because I'm currently a leader back home, and so I want to gather all the skills that are out there for me to grasp and take it back home and lead my peers. My expectation is that we are um, able to learn leadership skills, that we're able to grow as young African-American men and we're able to uh, gain confidence as we enter the, uh, the adult world. An ethical leader is essentially a good leader but uh, all of us know that when we ask questions like this, they're far more complex than simple answers like an ethical leader is a leader who does good or who is a good leader. But the uh, standing definition that we use for ethical leadership is that ethical leadership is the critical appropriation of certain kinds of traditions and cultural narratives that shape certain kind of people. My basic idea is, is that leadership does not arise out of a historical vacuum. It's always uh, a part of a certain kind of community of discourse and practice. Mandela might be another example of an ethical leader. Uh, you don't understand Mandela without the struggles of the ANC, the early struggles, his long-term imprisonment, and then his emergence as a leader and all of the kind of historical circumstances which produced him. So I'm interested now in how we return to those kinds of traditions, which we uh, see as uh, containing a certain kind of cultural narrative that predisposes leaders to do ethical things, to be, provide ethical actions, uh, use ethics in discernment, deliberation, and decision. Just open wide open, right? Like, I could probably solve this whole problem. I could pressure the company to do something. Take note of this, because this will come up. A traffic light. In some cases, you're not even a traffic light. You're a traffic cop. There are very few transformational leaders, those who will look at the world and say, I see it differently. And I see it so differently from you. And it's so obvious to me, I don't see why you all don't get it. I value what I can do, but it's not about me. It's about the people, right? So my name is Trey Watson. I'm a Vision Quest facilitator working with these kids uh, for a couple of years now. We got a new batch in and we're actually having a conversation about the processes necessary to make uh, transformative decisions, those decisions that transform an environment. And we're, right now we're actually talking about the, uh, the three Ds of discernment, deliberation, and decision making. The reason why I say that this is the most important time is because you were born as a dream first. You were never supposed to survive. You were never supposed to be here. You are the descendants of those who survived. You are the descendants of those who dared to believe in something bigger than themselves. You are the descendants of those who would rather kill than die. Uh, this program is the most important, I think, um, in my experience, primarily because now is when we need leadership more than ever. I think for the longest time we've been operating really under survival mode, the expectation that what we need to do is make two ends meet. Um, as I told these young men earlier, we're the descendants of those individuals who are just never supposed to be. And that makes them unique, that makes them survivors, it's in their blood. But we need to move past the survival mode, past the point where we're just thinking about what we need to do from day to day, and to think about the possibilities of the future. And in order to do that, we need leaders who are able to see what the future could be and transform the landscape, transform the way we think about things, and move forward and guide people towards that end. We could do something like the problem in our community is developing a strong foundation. And then you can incorporate family, you can incorporate education, you can incorporate a lot of things. You're saying that, all right, here's the government funding. This is what the government's doing. 
here, here's the property value of this government funding. Now we're going to take this value and we're going to fund that based on the, the minimum funds we're already putting in. Uh, I was lucky enough to do some work at Harvard University where uh, much of the work is actually case based on the Socratic method. We found that in working with these young men, we try to get them to uh, think outside the bounds of the, own con their, uh, the constraints that they tend to have when they, when they walk into the course. So we found that the Socratic method, where we ask questions, we ask them to ask each other questions, to debate one another openly, honestly, is the way to stimulate consciousness. And so when we talk about things like discern, dis um, deliberate, uh, in deciding on major actions to transform uh, conditions, we found that we have to question a lot of the things that we're doing. We have to reflect on the ideas that we have and the experiences that we've had in order to be most effective. Anything that happens to you must happen to me. You are my brother. If, if I cannot help you, then I am failing. This isn't a speech that I'm just giving because it's kind of cool or kind of boring. It's because it's true. And if you don't get that piece, we are falling well behind. To the greater point, we're talking about what happens with life and sacrifice. Can you ever sacrifice for an individual if you really are not feeling it? The greatest challenge for these young men will be to realize how powerful they actually are. We spend the whole week really forcing these young men to question themselves and being comfortable with questioning, to generate ideas and being more than comfortable but adamant about what those ideas are, to not only be adamant but ultimately courageous in enacting them. And that's, the, I think, probably the greatest thing holding back young men today is that courage. Really, under, not only just understanding what has to be done, but having the courage to enact what they believe has to be done. My great love for uh, working with young people is that um, they make me feel younger. <laughs> and more importantly, I think they ask the right quest questions. I certainly haven't given up on all existing leadership, but I think that the future of our nations, of our communities, indeed our world, rests on the shoulders, on the inquisitive minds and the creative imaginations of the young. Hello. I'm Nick King for the family. Um, do you believe that like, hip-hop and media like, influences our children in Uh, these days, kids are choosing role models based off of like the media and their environment, and sometimes those role models that they choose are not always positive. And say that, and and that would be perfect. And then we go on to who's involved, Alex. Yeah, where's Alex? Forty-five percent of new marriages in the United States of America end in divorce. That's nearly half of all marriages in the United States will end in some form of separation or divorce. Um, of the single parent family homes, 83% are female and 17% are male. Like for every three African Americans we send to college, one has to go to jail. That, 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 that's not as young. What scientific research has been done on this topic? Cor with the, because correlation does not equal causation. Now there may be a correlation between media and what effects it has on our teens, our young ones, but what scientific research has been done to prove that there's a definitive argument that saying the media and what's being presented in music and things of the nature are actually causing these things that are happening in our community. But now let's look at where our kids are going the majority of the week, the majority of their day, where they're spending it, in school. The actors that we focus on in school are the teachers. So basically, we need to think of teachers more as this source of knowledge, this ability to further ourselves. Your presentation kind of applied to like the cookie cutter family. So how would your programs reach out to single, single um, parent homes and foster families and kids who might not have a, a stable uh, background like that? So today, we had a case study. Um, basically, the question was, what is the most pressing question or problem in your community? Um, and each individual peer leader group um, had their own individual and separate um, answer to that question. And we all kind of separated it into the ways that um, Dr. Fluker uh, showed it to us and we explained it in the best way we could. Um, yeah, I'd say it's one of the hardest things uh, just because we had to kind of break down something that a lot of people don't look at most times. 
So it was kind of like breaking down something you can't see. Um, so, you know, we took it on and I think we did a good job at it. The way that we can solve all of these problems is that we need people like us, these very people in the room. We're going to make it. We're going to get out. We're going to go to the next level. But we can't end there. We have to go back to where we came from. We have to go help the people who aren't nearly as fortunate as us. And if we can do that, if we can help the people who need our help, we can destroy all of these stigmas and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We chose these young men um, by looking at a number of different criteria. Uh, first is, first was certainly aptitude, right? I mean, in order to lead people, you simply have to have the capacity to lead, the certain skills that you need. So of course we looked at their GPA, we looked at their writing skills, the way they communicate. But also we look, in order to lead, you have to have a sense of possibility and vision. You need to feel like there's something greater out there. And in each one of these young men, there is a deep sense of potential deep sense of possibility and they wrote that out. They explained what, their, what they thought leadership was. They explained how they felt they could become leaders. And in order to become uh, what we all believe our race of young men need to be, these, those aptitudes, those outlooks on life are the ones that have to survive. Those are the ones that have to prevail. Palms together and then open your arms and stretch your legs. One, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I might have to stretch him out so he can like hold him though. Okay, I think I got it. My name is Emby Buckner and Project Adventure is an international adventure education company doing active learning. So our mission is about helping groups and agencies use active learning to achieve their goals and their mission. Hey, trees and ropes, people. Trees and ropes. That was very quick. Now we can't mess up now. It's like one step, it's like two of my steps. Now it's all the trees. So as a company, we have a lot of different modalities we use. We do education curriculums for PE, health, wellness, adventures in the classroom. And tools we use for that are the challenge course. So we use low and high elements to help groups of individuals become better teams. You can, I know you can. All right, get ready to back up. Get ready to back up, y'all. Right, step, 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 step. Communication, leadership, listening, honesty, respect, all of these things come in that umbrella of teamwork. And so through the lows, the games, the initiatives, and the high elements, we can really help in the moment get to that and have them see the advantages of those. No. All right, so no, you're ready to sit back. back. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm ready. All right, All right. sit back. <laughs> bad boy. Like, bad boy. Like, Y'all didn't let me know you were going to let me go down. Oh. See, and then, see, because I was, I took my hands off, oh. and then all of a sudden, bam. <laughs> For me, for today, it's been great. I love working with leadership groups. We do a lot with Morehouse, and it's always just a pleasure and a joy to do that. And I think, as I said at the end of our group, just, it gives such, I'm getting chills, it gives <laughs> such encouragement for our future to know that there are these programs and that there are these groups of young people heading out into our world because there's so much out there that's not positive. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you MB. Thank you give me hope for our future, oh. amazingly hope for our future. <laughs> oh. um, so oh. as you go on, how much longer do y'all have together? Uh, yeah. Two days. Two more days. Yeah, two, two more days. days. So remember yeah, what y'all have done here together? It was amazing stuff. 
Remember the support you all had for each other, and remember what you had to support. Pinkies <laughs> up. Four. 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 Pick it up whenever you please, just like a dead beat dead. Honestly, as far as I can see, there's only a handful of people making it to paradise. Oh. Criminalizing young black youth, which was creating some tension between black youth and who else? Police. And the police. police. That's where you get groups like NWA, NWA. talking about the tension between young black youth and the police. My name is Dr. Joycelyn Wilson. I'm a visiting scholar of hip-hop studies at Morehouse College Leadership Center and in African American Studies. And my program is called the Hip-Hop 2020 Curriculum Project. <laughs> Hip Hop 2020 is a program that focuses on developing the next generation of emerging leaders and scholars. Um, and we use hip hop as a framework for doing that. When people hear me say we use hip hop as a framework for developing our next leaders, the question is, how do you do that? You don't have to talk about killing people or bitches and hoes and a whole bunch of negative stuff to sell albums. Young people are so inundated by popular culture and hip hop being one of the driving forces behind it. But then hip hop also opens up opens us up to some narratives that particularly African American men can relate to. Knowing yourself and having knowledge of self is one of hip hop's elements. It's part of it's um, philosophy. You have the four cultural elements of breakdancing, rapping, um, DJing, graffiti art, and then you have the social element, those things that are going on that gives access to expression. You gotta ask the question of this. Yeah, the world is really screwed up. There's a lot of social violence, there's a lot of instigated violence, but does that mean, does that mean, does that, does that give you opportunity yeah you can talk about it but what are you going to do about it it's one thing to be a leader uh, it's easy I can lead anybody anywhere but where are you going why are you going there and what's going to happen to you and that person when you get there those are the things that these young people discover when they go through this process because it's extremely important for ethical leaders to number one know themselves know the relationship they have with other people and create a community that's going to be more just more wholesome uh, so that when they're bringing their families up, they can smile and say, I've done something that's better than me. That makes good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, be very clear that one, you want an entire mask that covers everything. And if you're going to close your nose, we need to get uh, some straws so it becomes small and put into your nostrils so that you can breathe. <laughs> 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 that um, it stays. In this module, we engage in mask making because we teach that ethics begins with facing the other. And we also encourage participants to think of the face of the other as being related to their face. Therefore, ethics doesn't just begin with principles, with rules, with codes of conduct, but it begins with in intimacy and the ability to project one's face onto the face of the other and to share space with the other. As a part of the ethical leadership model, our concern is with the question of recognition and how recognition leads to respect and reverence for the other. It is important, I think, especially for African-American males and for other historically marginalized groups who've had to deal with pejorative uh, self-concept, self-perception, and even perceptions of others about who they are. 
uh, so that they might begin to ask different questions about their own identity. Often the mask that we wear is a product of a larger culture uh, which has been used often surreptitiously uh, to hide deep, deep feelings of frustration, of anger, of despair, and a longing for a better and a truer self. We also share with the young men that the most uh, intimate part of the human being is not necessarily uh, the genitalia as the popular culture promotes, but it really is the other's face, the other's eyes, the nose, the projection that comes from the look of the other. Leaders in the 21st century will need to have a good sense of the different masks that they wear in order to nego negotiate the traffic, but also be aware that these masks can become restricting inhibiting and prevent them from being their higher and their better selves. All right, this is my mask. Basically, after having, after having some of the discussions uh, today and throughout the trip, I realized that I'm African American, but I, don't, I didn't really know fully what that meant, and I still don't. So that's why I demonstrated that. So here's the black part, which represents me being African American. Then I have the eyes being red, because it represents anger of not really fully knowing what I am, but I'm also really sad about it. So I represent that through tears, rolling down the eyes, and uh, that's basically my mask. With my mask, there is an overall theme of peace that pretty much makes up the majority of the face. And the reason peace is so important is because peace represents a state of understanding, and understanding is critical to our awareness in the world. And if we're gonna stay aware, we need to make sure that we understand the connection between ourselves and our community. My eyes are closed because I'm in a state of meditation and appreciation for who I really am and where I am in the world. This ritual is called the Burning Bowl Ritual. It's really the combination of the Day of Integrity, where early on students who have already created masks on one another's face earlier in the week, decorate the mask in the afternoon and begin to ra raise questions about the different masks we wear and the pejorative representations of self that are often um, met it out by society, by culture. So it's very important that students have an opportunity to examine uh, their deepest meaning, their deepest truth. We, we always ask three questions. Who are you? What do you really want? And how do you get what you want? So during the ritual itself, I and another leader take them through a journey of contemplating the mask. We ask, look at the face in your hand. What is this face that you hold in your hand? Is this face the real you? How will you live with this face now that you know that it is not the real you? The students process, led by the African drummers and the other leaders, to the obelisk where Howard Thurman's remains are and toward the statue of Martin Luther King Jr. And there, uh, again, students get a chance to uh, make affirmations of self. And most importantly, they burn the messages that were written on the cards.
are not an accident. You did not arrive here by accident. It's by design. You are here on purpose. Tonight, we fulfill part of our destiny by getting rid of everything that stands in our way and affirming everything that is positive and good about it. Burning these cards is only a symbol of all of the things that you will have to burn for the rest of your life in order to move into that future. Say your name. To make the mess for me, um, at first it was a little uncomfortable. I wasn't really sure uh, what to expect, especially having someone else make the mask on me and uh, making the mask for someone else. But um, as I went through the process of being so detailed on um, putting the plaster and um, just really shaping it to their face, I got to understand the, the value um, of another person. Um, but after the masks were made and after we painted what we thought um, we embodied or, um, or the fakeness that we share, I realized that the mask as a leader um, is a, a false sense of security that we have. And um, as leaders we have to throw off the mask in a sense um, because those masks that we created um, on our own faces are not really who we are but, um, but what we feel like other people should see and not our true self. Um. It's time to leave now, but I'm leaving. A better leader. Got some new brothers here. I'm glad I have them. Without them, you know, couldn't get through it. I'm glad I'm leaving. Ready to go out to live my community and give back and make it a beloved community. Uh, it's kind of bittersweet. Like, I'm happy to go home, but it's still depressing because I'm leaving all my friends. You guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, this whole experience has just been transformational for me as a person because it really helped me identify who I am. Hold on, let me take the shades off of this man. Hey, it's, it really helped me identify who I am and like helped me get over some of the burdens that I've been carrying for the past few years. And like I feel like after being liberated from all that, I can better lead people because I better know I better know myself and I have a deeper understanding of the values that are needed to be a leader. Really the part that got me was compassion, where it's like, we can't, I can't stand to see this, the sight of you suffering, and that we all do this together. No one's truly free until everyone is. And I used to think that leadership was people that accepted and followed uh, leader's values or another person's values, which is kind of the textbook definition. So it kind of put more emotion in terms of leadership for me. I've been to many things and uh, this is definitely the most unique of the experiences I've done. There's just such a wide spectrum of individuals here from all around the country, and you really get people from all walks of life, and you do some rituals that will really open your eyes. Uh, when I first got here, I was thinking, what, what's this guy doing? Why are we going to a dark room? I, I don't really understand this. And I was kind of laughing, you know, like, mm, this is kind of silly. And uh, as the week progressed, um, I started to understand the purpose behind doing these things and it actually really changed my perception and my outlook on life. Um, I believe that my identity as an African American male simply is just to um, help others around me and I, um, my purpose is to do that as I go further in life and I want to do that through uh, leadership positions that I hold in the future and um, also just through connecting with my peers and I just want to keep all of my um, Morehouse brothers in uh, in mind as I go through my life and this has just been a great, great experience.
My son had a wonderful experience. Um, he had texts this week that he was very busy, and then his other text said that he was having the experience of a lifetime. Um, I didn't speak to him much, but I felt that with my prayers that the Lord was giving him a blessed experience here. Still today, many young African American men don't always see the positive role models that are educated and bright and willing to, you know, be a leader and willing to feel that it's okay to be smart and to read and to enjoy learning. And with them being here, seeing other young men like them, that's just so important for them to, to even see that. Um, I'm just truly <clears throat> blessed that our son has had the opportunity to experience this program, being around young African-American men, that they can see that they're all doing well and wishing each other well. And, and it was so enlightening, again, to see how they have bonded with one another, how many of them said that they hope to see each other again, how they'll keep in touch with each other. So I think that this was a blessed and valuable experience for our son and really thankful that he had the opportunity to experience, to experience this program. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling seas Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on to victory. Let us march on to victory. Let us march on to victory. Is one.